Is it news, sales, or protecting the ultra-rich? Here in part one, most people don't trust the news. We've learned to distrust it. There's lots and lots of data that have told us that it's really not worth trusting anymore. We are all being manipulated by the mind control of the ultra-rich, trying to sell us, trying to distort us, trying to control us. There's lots and lots of data about this, and we're going to present some of this in this little movie here. This is the news. You got a problem with the news now? <laughs> yeah, I got a big goddamn problem with the news. You ready for this? The news is completely manipulated. Everything you hear every single day is designed by corporate media to do one thing and one thing only. Jesus. To keep you living in fear. Okay. Total fear. Fear so you'll go out and you'll spend money on things. Things you probably don't even need. Things you probably already have six of so that their advertisers can keep buying ads on their stations. One more thing, you ready for this? I'll do this all day, man. I got days of day night at home, you don't believe me? Dismiss us. An uprising of the middle class. That's how demonstrations of up to 120,000 people across Israel are being dubbed. An estimated 50,000 are here in Tel Aviv alone, despite Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's housing reform last Tuesday. His approval ratings dropped to 32% as the price of basic goods and housing rises. People who contribute to the state, go into the army, fight and pay ridiculously high taxes, can't make ends meet. They can't afford a standard one-bedroom apartment, says this protester. The biggest social movement in Israel in four decades started last month with a boycott on dairy products when prices shot up. The crowds, including Israeli Arabs, accuse the government of being in the pockets of financial chiefs and say they're fed up with an Israel of monopolies and cartels. Great big, giant, ultra-rich money, big tobacco, big pharma, controlling the media. The Israel protest over the ultra-rich disregard for the poor and middle class. You see, the media is the pawn of the ultra-rich, and they don't want to cover the complete story of attacking the ultra-rich people. Finally, do something to tackle the yawning wealth gap. One Tel Aviv street has already been relabeled by some as Tahrir Corner, named after the site of Egypt's uprising. But as RT's Paula Slea reports, they're concerned it's taken this much pressure to get any kind of reaction. But what kind of coverage did they get in the world press? Tens of thousands on the streets of Israel, angry, fed up, and protesting for change. But is anyone listening? When it comes to Israel, a lot of uh, the foreign media want to see more of an action movie. And this hasn't been very violent. It's been very, it hasn't been violent at all. It's been very positive. It's not an action movie. Oh my God, that's what they want. Week three, the largest demonstration in Israel in over a decade. And how did ABC, CBS and NBC cover it? They didn't. A young woman set up a tent. While the editors of France 24, BBC and Sky coughed up just a few meager seconds. Perhaps it's not even that interesting to their editors back, you know, back uh, in the studios. Okay, there's a protest. Well, what exactly is a protest? A social protest? Well, is it a revolution? It's not the same kind of story that they're used to, and it's not as big and dramatic as some of the bigger revolutions happening around. They're not the telling the story that these revolutions are about poor protesting the rich. And Amir Mizrach isn't surprised by the worldwide lack of media interest. He's worked in the Israeli press for a decade, reporting for media both foreign and local. There is a box that the international media has put Israel in, and that is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, also the Israeli-Lebanese and Syrian conflict. And anything that doesn't kind of fit into that is not the immediate type of, of news item, which is unfortunate. Yes, be a good American. Don't try to think. It might hurt. That just makes Hannah Reyes and others angry. For nine days, she's been camping here, furious that she can't make ends meet as a university student. It makes me upset that when Egypt decided to stand up and say, we've had enough, and when in Lebanon they decided to say, we've had enough, the media was all over there. I haven't seen anyone from CNN or from Fox News or any other you know, big news channel here and... It's really sad. We also deserve a chance to be heard out. This street has been dubbed Tahir Corner by some of the people here. 
and optimism perhaps that they too can bring down a government in the way their neighbours in Tahrir Square, Cairo did. But whereas the cameras there were rolling non-stop, here they're pretty absent. Tens of thousands of Spaniards have marched through Madrid and reclaimed the Puerta del Sol Square, the epicenter of protests over the country's economic crisis. The mass rally was also over the use of force by riot police on smaller demonstrations on Thursday night over the closure of the square. Police had cleared the remaining indignados or indignants out on Tuesday. Seoul symbolizes the start of a new awakening in Spain in which people unite, in which people call for social improvements. People are demanding their rights, rights they had already gained but which are being taken from them. We started seeing this in Tunisia, where protests from the poor and middle class really were able to get out a government. Then we saw it in Egypt, where we saw the poor people able to make a difference and to get him retired. But they don't really want to cover this story in the American press. The American press is called riots, not really poor protests, because they don't want Americans to know that there is power in the streets. They don't really want that type of story told. So the world media is not really telling the story that's happened in Yemen and all around the Mideast, Israel and etc. They don't really want to tell that whole story. In London, the rioters are out there because they have been, money has been taken away from them. They don't have the things that they could do anymore. You see, it used to be no such thing as billionaires. In 1985, there was 13. Now there's over 2,000 of them. That's what's going on, rich people. Uh, Bill had a great and conclusive meeting yesterday with John Bonacue. Let's look a little Although bit at what happened in Meet Joe vote. Black. Um, thank you. Drew, um... Yeah. I did enjoy, or rather I was interested in meeting John Barnacue yesterday. And, um... Impressive, I suppose. John Barnacue is supposed to be Rupert but, uh, Murdoch. But... It did get me to thinking. See, I started in this business because this is what I wanted to do. I knew I wasn't going to write the great American novel, but I also knew there was more to life than buying something for a dollar and selling it for two. I'd hoped to create something, something which could be held to the highest standards. And what I realized was I... I wanted to give the news to the world. And I wanted to give it unvarnished. Uh, the more we all know about each other, the greater the chance we will survive. Sure, I want to make a profit. You can't exist without one. But uh, <laughs> John Bonacue is all profit. This is a parody of Rupert Murdoch's profit-making news corporations. Uh, if we give him license to absorb parish communications, and he has his eye on a few others after us, in order to reach the world, you will have to go through John Bonacue. And not only will you have to pay him to do this, far more important, you'd have to agree with him. Reporting the news is a privilege and a responsibility, and it is not exploitable. Parish Communications has earned this privilege. John Bonacue wants to buy it. As your chairman, I urge you to agree. This company is not for sale. Is the news for sale? Well, it looks like in the movies they're playing some of the news people as bad guys, like here in the 007 Tomorrow Never Dies. But in real life, Conrad Black was also the same way. Many of these people really are not just portrayed in the movies as bad guys, but they're found to be in real life. You see, what's going on is people are selling news, twisting news, contorting news, and they're not really covering the basic news stories. They're trying to make money and profit out of the news. And that's not really what it's supposed to be about. 
There are several topics that the media just will not allow discussion of at all. We can't call that any type of freedom of speech. Many different topics which I try to cover in my different movies cannot be discussed at all. You see, they can't talk about eco-economic education. If you talk about that, that's going to be a problem. Because that's going to cut into the profits. You can't talk about the big head versus the little head. No, I don't want to talk about those type issues in the press. I don't want to talk about the body electric and interfere with the profits of the drug companies. And you sure don't want to discuss that synthetic drugs are an insult to the body. You see, we like to think that there's real freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. But ultra rich has really seen to it that is gone. The biggest selling newspaper, The News of the World, has announced it's shutting down this Sunday in response to a phone hacking scandal. The tipping point came as it emerged that the paper had been hacking into the phones of murder and terror victims, as well as dead soldiers. The paper is a jewel in the crown of Rupert Murdoch's global media empire, and a public inquiry has been promised by the government. Uh, the News of the World journalist had allegedly hacked into the telephone of a missing girl, Millie Dowler, who uh, it was later found had been murdered. And what they had done was hacked into her voicemail, not just listened to it, but also deleted messages that were already there to clear out her voicemail box, to receive other messages from people who were looking for her, desperate to find her, and thereby get leads for stories that they were writing. Uh, we also now know uh, that allegedly senior police officers had been bribed uh, by the News of the World for tip-offs on criminal investigations and other confidential information, which is, of course, a crime. And of course, arrests would have been made in connection with bribing the police very high profile arrests. So really, uh, there are two things that we, we should take away from this for now. Uh, one of them is, uh, surely this kind of action uh, couldn't have taken place without an okay from the very highest level. And in fact, I spoke to someone today who knew, uh, who knows the editor, the current editor of the News of the World. Rupert Murdoch said to her, you have to keep this paper in high circulation, around <laughs> four million copies a day, and you have to do it by any means possible. So it's almost like he was giving the green light to that from the very beginning. We don't know that, of course. Uh, and also, is this an isolated incident? Is phone tapping and hacking uh, something that goes on throughout News Corporation? And is it an isolated incident within News Corporation or other, other newspapers, in fact, in the UK who engage in that kinds of, those kinds of behaviour? Those are the questions we should be asking. And really, the questions that we should be asking, we're not asking. And what takes down Rupert Murdoch is really just a little story about wiretapping a couple of little people not really into the different ideas of what he's really doing and how he's twisting the news. I love this little picture with the horns and <laughs> guys who shirt me above it. But we need to take a look at, here's what Chinese television has to say. We cover how editors were made aware of where stories came from. It would also cover how and under what circumstances Trinity Mirror pay for stories. CNN has posted both an op-ed and video segment talking about the future of journalism. The author points out Britain is an uproar over the scandal, which will have international implications on media ethics. There is no statutory control of newspapers. There was uh, a form of self-control called the Press Complaints Commission, uh, which was staffed mainly by, it seems, by serving editors. This was extremely weak uh, and it showed itself to be utterly powerless and toothless during this scandal. Um, in addition, uh, membership is voluntary and one of the newspaper groups has pulled out. So that will definitely be changed. Um, there is a, an, a, uh, an inquiry has been set up to come up with new ideas. The Press Complaint Commission is an independent body which administers the system of self-regulation for the press in Britain. It does so primarily by dealing with complaints, framed within the terms of the editor's code of practice about the editorial content of newspapers, magazines, their websites and the conduct of journalists. I think the media needs to regulate itself and you have a discipline also of the market because if the readers and the advertisers decide that they no longer want to deal with a particular news brand then that brand will die which is of course what happened with the news of the world the brand became toxic and so it had to die but the hacking scandal shows that self-discipline alone is not sufficient whether there is a need for stricter regulation and who administer it 
are old questions for journalism. What there will be, I think there will be a more powerful body where people who feel that they have been wronged by the newspapers have a right to go to it and a right to receive uh, a fair hearing and uh, if they're found to have been wronged to get their view across in a prominent position. But I think under the pressure of, um, of public opinion there would be a more realistic form uh, where uh, a forum where readers who feel they have been uh, abused by the papers can get some, um, if not justice, can get uh, a hearing and some recompense and indeed, if necessary, a correction. Meanwhile, governments are considering necessary regulations. An inquiry into the phone hacking scandal ordered by Prime Minister Cameron opened on July 28th. The inquiry will focus on media ethics and decide whether tougher media regulation is needed. Australian Federal Privacy Minister Brendan O'Connor confirmed that the Australian government was considering whether to strengthen privacy laws, paving the way for Australians to sue media organisations for any breaches. Besides media ethics, Public criticism has concentrated on Murdoch's control of a huge proportion of local and global media through News International and News Corporation. Experts say it diminishes competition and diversity on the global media landscape. The public may be adequately acquainted with the Murdoch perspective. The conglomerate Murdoch controls through a family trust owns a movie studio, a broadcast network, pay TV channels, and newspapers around the globe. The media titan was ranked by Forbes magazine as the 13th most powerful person in the world in 2010 and the 117th richest with a net wealth worth of more than six billion US dollars. Although Murdoch closed the news of the world and abandoned the bid for B Sky B, he still owns The Sun, The Times and The Sunday Times and 39.1% of B-Sky B in Britain. Some journalists worry his dominance works against a free and fair media. But obviously the longer this scandal goes on, the more doubt will be cast and the less public, public opinion in the UK will be in favour of him increasing his uh, holdings, media holdings in the UK, and that could potentially have a bad effect on his huge uh, empire and holdings in, in the US. Labour leader Ed Miliband has called for Murdoch's British media empire to be broken up and he wants media ownership rules to change. Australian media has the same concern, discussing the possibility that his parliament might revise media ownership laws with a view to limiting any Murdoch expansion in television and other electronic media. Well, in Australia, the media is very concentrated. In other words, 11 of 12 newspapers are owned by Murdoch or Fairfax. 70% of news that is published in newspapers is owned by Murdoch. So for Australia, the question is, do we need more diversity? Do we need more proprietors? Do we need a greater, a, a, a wider array of media to represent all interests of the Australian community? The News of the World scandal revealed important levels of collision between media, police and politicians in Britain. It is hard to know what will flow from the scandal next. What is certain is that the regulation of the printed press in Britain whose ethics are self-regulated, is set to change. Media are fundamental in our societies, and they constitute the major sources of information. The social responsibility of the media is to pursue the truth, but not at the cost of ordering people's privacy. The press has a duty to stay neutral, objective, and balanced in all circumstances. It is also important for the public to enjoy a vibrant and diverse media, and hear voices from different perspectives. But now that we're talking about massive, massive, massive ultra-rich people, we're not hearing those voices. Coming up, an investigation of how the Japanese press and radio influenced the general public's enthusiasm for war. The media whipped up public opinion, didn't it? NHK and other media were the biggest promoters of the war. Then when it was over, they said it was a mistake. 
70 years ago, Japanese society was engulfed in a wave of fanaticism. The nation was heading down a deliberately engineered path to war. This national fever was the product of the press, radio and other media. These accounts also shed light on how the military used the media to manipulate public opinion. Take a look at this chart. It shows the combined circulations of Japan's three major newspapers at that time. You can see the number surged in the period leading up to the war. This is why it's said the media played a major role in driving the nation to war. Welcome. Takejimuno is one of the few pre-war newspaper men still alive. This is from before the war, when I was a reporter. It was the Manchurian incident that prompted Muno to become a reporter. But on the day the war ended, he had it in his resignation, feeling responsible for the war as a journalist. Every newspaper publisher saw their circulation increase at the time of war. More people, especially the parents and wives of those on the front line, bought newspapers because they wanted to be updated on the war. So, war was not a bad thing for newspapers in terms of business. Did newspapers drive public opinion? I believe they did. After all, newspapers carried false stories saying Japan was winning when it was not. I'm sure the public believed them and were fooled into thinking things would be even better in the future. At a time of global depression, the success of Japanese troops in Manchuria elated people back home. It also proved a shot in the arm for newspapers struggling with slow sales. There's no doubt newspapers saw their sales rise from the Manchurian incident. They then scrambled to escalate coverage of the event, further boosting their readership. That, in turn, drove the masses to clamor for the military campaign to be expanded. Live broadcasts from the front were quite popular. Public support for war was a must. The message had to be Japan is winning. There was no other choice. Right after the frontline broadcast, throngs of people crowded Yasukuni's shrine in Tokyo. Many of them kneeled down on the ground, praying late into the night. Because of the radio reports, the public had an inflated view of Japan's military power, unaware of what was happening in the battlegrounds. I figured we were winning. <laughs> At the time, I never thought Japan would lose. Radio was like a god. That's what we thought back then. We trusted it completely. We believe the military was strong. The media had turned public opinion into national frenzy, which was one of the factors that drove the Japanese to war. The true role of journalism is to investigate events in the world. 
and present correct information on them to the public. That way, people are able to make cool-headed decisions. But as we just saw from how the media behaved in a wartime, what's apparent is that things start going wrong for the whole country as soon as the media runs off the rails. It really doesn't take much time for the nation's fate to change drastically. The media has that kind of power. And we've been reminded of that fact. We should never allow a war to break out. We must not let that happen. After starting a war, you might realize how terrible it really is and try to stop it, but it's too late. You can't stop a war once it begins. Then, what do we need to do to make sure we don't start one? That's easy. We need to find out what's actually happening in the world. What are other countries like the United States, China or Russia thinking about? We must be aware of the reality that surrounds us and honestly let each other know. We should never allow a war to break out. We must not let that happen. So as we've seen, the media drove the Japanese to war. All to increase the media sale of papers. They made about one million dollars by today's standards, but what was the result for Japan? Seventy million died in the war, and Japan 3.5 million dead. Tokyo completely destroyed, 75% of the Japanese cities destroyed. Two atomic bombs killing women and children dropped on these people. Property loss staggering, social costs beyond comprehension, till to sell a couple of papers. The media cannot be allowed to focus, capitalize, and drive mankind's faults into war. The media has a moral responsibility to embrace, to promote, to encourage humanity's virtues, not its negative. This was a horrendous experience. War is good for a few people, bad for most. Now let's look at how the media is owned and operated by the ultra-rich. The ultra-rich do not want to pay taxes or to pay their full fair share. So let's look at how the media twists and covers up some of these events. Corporate media is always telling us lies. Things are twisted and changed to protect the incomes of the people who own the media. Making sure that big tobacco is not really threatened or Big Pharma. They can twist the stories like CBC twists their investigative research stories. You can't trust the corporate media. The mother of all bullshit, as some would say. We need to take a look at and really evaluate and find new ways of looking because now that money's gotten involved, money is controlling things. CBC did an absolute butcher job of bad journalism against me. America is not broke. Not by a long shot. The country is awash in wealth and cash. Michael would tell us. It's just that it's not in your hand. It has been diverted to the ultra rich. And the, the ultra-rich owns media. Now let's look at some of the ways that President Obama tries President to change the United this. States getting ready to address the nation, indeed the world, from the White House. Momentarily, we will hear from President Obama. He will make the case uh, on how the United States can avoid default. Good evening. Tonight I want to talk about the debate we've been having in Washington over the national debt. A debate that directly affects the lives of all Americans. For the last decade, we've spent more money than we take in. In the year 2000, the government had a budget surplus. 
But instead of using it to pay off our debt, the money was spent on trillions of dollars in new tax cuts, while two wars and an expensive prescription drug program were simply added to our nation's credit card. As a result, the deficit was on track to top $1 trillion the year I took office. Let's ask the wealthiest Americans and biggest corporations to give up some of their breaks in the tax code and special deductions. This balanced approach asks everyone to give a little without requiring anyone to sacrifice too much. It would reduce the deficit by around $4 trillion and put us on a path to pay down our debt. Lawmakers in the U.S. Congress are voting to approve the last-minute $2.4 trillion deal to raise America's debt borrowing limit. The plan, which was backed by the White House on Sunday night, will allow the $14.3 trillion credit ceiling to be increased, preventing America defaulting on its debt. Uh, we, we need a, a bigger plan. We need people that are willing to make the hard decisions. But right now in this country, making the hard decisions doesn't get you reelected. Republican leaders say they're optimistic the vote will go through. Vice President Joe Biden has been trying to convince those still undecided, including House of Representatives Democrat leader Nancy Pelosi, who criticized the lack of new taxes for America's wealthiest. Possibility the U.S.'s credit rating could be downgraded from its current triple A as details of the deal disappointed the experts at the credit ratings agencies. Ratings agencies were talking of uh, wanting to see tax increases of the order of something like two trillion. Uh, and as far as we can see in the small print of this, um, there are no tax increases at all here. Mm -hmm. So the reductions are all going to come on the spending side. Which will put more downward pressure on an already weak U.S. economy. So investors went back to selling shares and moving their money into so-called safe haven assets like gold and the Swiss franc. America's credit rating drops because they would not tax the ultra-rich. There's no room to really cover this story in the media. AAA credit rating for the first time ever. Standard & Poor's has downgraded the states to AA plus in a move likely to raise borrowing costs in America. S&P says the fiscal consolidation plan agreed earlier this week falls short of what's needed. President Barack Obama was given advance warning of the downgrade. S&P's criticized the political gridlock in Washington and indicated a further downgrade could follow in the next 12 to 18 months. The leaders of the world's two largest economies enjoy an increasingly close, if formal, relationship. But as America's largest creditor, China has become alarmed at the state of U.S. finances and attempts to restructure its debts. Or, put more simply, it's worried about getting its money back. Their concerns may have been heightened by the historic downgrading on Friday of the U.S.'s AAA credit rating by Agency Standard & Poor. On Saturday, China criticized what it called the short-sighted wrangling in the United States and it's calling for the introduction of a new, stable and secured global reserve currency to replace the dollar as the world's financial benchmark. The China Obama uh, has come out strong during this election season saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to do exactly what I uh, promised during the election. I'm going to give tax cuts to people making under $200,000 if they're individuals, $250,000 if they're a family. All right? And I am not going to maintain the Bush tax cuts for people making above that amount, which is about the top 2% of the country, right? Uh, and uh, the Republicans said, oh, no, we've got to get tax cuts for the rich. We've got to get tax cuts for the rich. And Obama said, look, did I stutter? If you vote this whole thing down because you want your tax cuts for the rich, you are holding middle-class America hostage. Fantastic. Nicely done. I've been saying all the last week, Hey, he's fighting harder. How do the very rich typically earn their income and how is it taxed? Let's look at this. Taking a page from the Forbes 400, the IRS has tracked the top 400 taxpayers over the last 16 years, asking what's happened to their incomes, what's happened to their taxes. And what we've seen is two major factors. One, their incomes have gone up very much. To make it into the top 400 in 2008, the most recent year for which data are available, you had to earn at least $110 million. The average for the top 400 is $270 million. So these people are really, really well off. But they don't pay a lot of tax. The question is why? It has a lot to do with the fact that much of their income comes from capital gains, which 
receive favorable tax rates. 60% in 2008 came from capital gains. In contrast, only 8% of their income came from salaries and wages for ordinary jobs. The rest of us, the rest of taxpayers, get about three quarters of our income from salaries and wages from our jobs, and a very small fraction, only about 5% from capital gains. Why does this make a difference? Because capital gains face a preferential tax rate of no more than 15%, in contrast to as much as 35% for salaries, wages, and other forms of income. So for the very wealthy, the top 400 who receive 60% of their income from capital gains, the 15% maximum rate on that form of income brings their overall tax rate down to only 18% in 2008. For the rest of us, we pay about 12.5%, certainly better, but if you compare the top 400 with, say, those people making between a half a million and a million dollars, people in that lower range, the half million to a million dollars, are paying about 24% tax rate on their income, much higher than that for these very, very wealthy people because the wealthy have so much preferentially taxed income. Another important factor is that capital gains does not face payroll taxes the way that salaries and earnings do. For most of us, getting three quarters of our income from salaries and wages, we face the payroll taxes that fund Social Security and Medicare. That's a 15.3% combined employer-employee rate, which for the wealthy earning most of their income from non-salary don't face at all. Last year, Roseanne Allshuler and I took a look at the question of what would happen if we raised taxes on a much broader segment, the segment the president's aimed at with incomes above $250,000. Suppose we raise their rates and only their rates. What would we have to do to close our budget gap, not completely, but bring it down to about half its current size? The answer was we'd have to take the top tax rate from the current 35% up to 77%. And that assumed that there would be no change in behavior on the parts of the people being subject to those higher taxes. Since they would, in fact, change their behavior, they would move their incomes around in ways so that less would be subject to tax, perfectly legal ways, but nonetheless move it around, we'd need to raise rates even higher. Those are political non-starters. It's not going to happen to raise the top tax rate to 77%. We had a brouhaha last year trying to raise it from 35 to 39.6% rate that was true before 2001. We're not going to see it going up to 77%. And as I say, that wouldn't solve the problem. That would only narrow the budget gap to half of its... What we've seen is that the ultra-rich really don't pay their fair share. They should. We should restructure these tax laws, especially in the ways of windfall tax profits. Who are struggling to survive, taking hundreds of billions of dollars and giving it to millionaires and billionaires. Both agree. Well, I hope we so. We should stop all five of the wars, but we do collect about $250 billion in taxes every month. Unfortunately, we also borrow $200 billion. We have corporations that don't play zip. We have the well, that trillionaires be, that don't pay that would zip. Be You've been a, a huge supporter of Ben Bernanke, the Fed chairman, calling him a hero. Yep. Uh, he warned this week about the ballooning deficit. He also said we can't raise taxes now and we can't cut spending now, but we have to be aware of how serious the problem is. Your take on that? Well, I wrote an article a year ago and said the same thing then. But we're, I, we certainly shouldn't cut ta raise taxes on anybody except the very rich. I think we should raise taxes on the very rich, and I think maybe we should cut taxes for the middle class, upper middle class, lower cut middle class. Cut them more than the Bush tax cuts? It, it could well be. I, I, I believe that, that in terms of the, the we're, we're taking in about 15 and a fraction percent of GDP and income in the United States. That isn't enough. I, we're going to have to get more money from somebody. Now, the question is, do we get more money from the person that's going to serve me lunch today, or do we get it from me? I think we should get it from me. and and. and I have a lower tax rate, counting payroll taxes, than anybody in my office, and I don't have a tax shelter. I just follow the, I just go take the form and fill out the numbers, and I think that's very wrong. And I think that if we're going to get money, and we're going to need money, I mean, we are not taking in enough money at, at, at the federal government level, and we there's spending cuts to be done. I'm sure of that, but we need more revenue too. And you know, there's only a few places to get it. You get it from corporations or you get it from individuals. And, and there's, you know, it, if we're going to get it from individuals, 
it shouldn't be the bottom 98%. It should be more from people at the top. But can you raise taxes right now or not extend the Bush tax cuts on the wealthiest Americans and uh, be sure that it won't affect the prosperity of American businesses right well, now? Because that's the argument on the other side. Well, if you get $100 billion more of taxes, just pick a number, from people like me at the top, it means you borrow $100 billion less out of the economy. Somebody's going to come up with $100 billion. Now, either the Fed starts monetizing debt or you... You're taking the money from the economy either way. The only question is whether you take it by borrowing or by taxes. And I see no problem in taxing people at the, at the very high levels uh, significantly more than they're being taxed now. And, and I might very well cut taxes even further, you know, for the people at, at lower levels. So even some of these rich people want to pay more tax. Let's look more. The first congressional hearing into what caused the turmoil on the U.S. markets last month has opened with a glimpse into the chaotic last hours of Lehman Brothers. Lehman's collapse, the biggest bankruptcy in U.S. history, created a domino effect, which led within days to the 500 billion euro bailout for the financial sector. Lehman boss Richard S. Fuld faced tough questions over his personal compensation. Your company is now bankrupt, our economy is in a state of crisis, but you get to keep $480 million. I, I have a very basic question for you. Is this fair? Fuld insisted U.S. regulators were aware of the full extent of the problem before the bank's collapse. One day after Lehman filed for bankruptcy protection, the authorities stepped in to rescue the insurance group AIG to the tune of 62 billion euros. Your company is now bankrupt, our economy is in a state of crisis, but you get to keep $480 million. I, I have a very basic question for you. Is this fair? Is this fair? I, I have a very basic question for you. Is this fair? I, I have a very basic question for you. Is this fair? The 455 richest entities in the world control 90% of the world's wealth, and they pay a very small percent of tax. If they paid the normal tax percent that normal people do in Europe, all the world's children would have equal economic education and would live a poverty-free life. This would end discrimination and poverty. $17 trillion is spent on new war weapons every year. That's over $3,000 for each person of the planet. That would end world hunger, end world poverty. And the Congress increased the nuclear bomb budget 15%. They said we don't have enough bombs. We all only have enough bombs to blow the planet up a thousand times. These are rich people. You see, we need more A-bombs to fight terrorists and rental cars that are on the streets. Is that what this is all about? More and more and more for the rich people. Well, I thought that maybe this might help you understand. What we got here is a failure to communicate. The eventual fate of people that really protest and try to oppose tyranny. So what side are you on? There are no sides. There's no Sunnis and Shiites. There's no Democrats and Republicans. There's only haves and have not. Yeah, the wealth's going to trickle down. <laughs> Oh, they're still laughing about that one. Uh, you see, they don't want equal economic education. They don't want to share. You see, it's not the idea. It's about haves and have-nots. And the haves want more and more. They don't want to share with the have-nots. We have deprived equal economic education to the poor. And this has created a problem. I can have democracy. Is that democracy if you don't have education? You see, we need the immigrants. Who's going to cut the lawn? Is that what's really going on? Yes. There are people benefiting it. Benefiting greatly. And the wealth is not trickling down. This is funny to them. We have a massive amount of people who have lost their homes. Thomas Jefferson said he sworn on the altar of God to oppose tyranny over the minds of men. He believed that the banks can be more dangerous to liberty than all the standing armies. And it's true, the wealthy people are more dangerous. So we need to do something to help people to stop losing their homes. And we need to supply some wealth at, at the bottom. Bosses of the news services only care about selling news. They don't care about truth or integrity. The news is twisted by the ultra-rich, made up by the ultra-rich. We've lost faith and we've lost trust in the news. 
Reporters are only rewarded for sensationalism. They're not rewarded by covering good, well-balanced articles. They only really want to see the, the sensationalism, the blood in the streets. The news services cover action, destruction, not real news. They don't really cover stories that will threaten them. It's many, many bad news. Good news doesn't really happen. It's all been spin, spin news making sure that people are told what they want them to hear. The civil war in Iraq was made up by the media. Incredible. To pretend that the FDA and Big Tobacco are not working together would be kind of crazy. See, they really are working together. Big Pharma controls the FDA. There's no doubt about it. News services won't cover stories that challenge this. They want to make sure that their profits are protected. So what do they do? They turn to people like CBC. The news is completely manipulated. Everything you hear every single day is designed by corporate media to do one thing and one thing only. Jesus. To keep you living in fear. Oh, fear? Total fear. Fear so you'll go out and you'll spend money on things. Things you probably don't even need. Things you probably already have six of. So that their advertisers will keep buying ads on their stations. Let's look at some of the journalism from... CBC, and some of the reports about this. Drug companies, tobacco companies, kill millions of people every year. They're the number one, number two killers of the world. Is it possible that they would wrongfully persecute a scientist who opposes their killing? We're going to see in a CBC TV interview of Dr. Nelson, me, and I, for three hours, explained to them about why synthetic drugs are an insult to the body and need to have an alternative but they didn't show one minute, not one second of anything of that. What they showed was sensationalism twists. It is known that everything is made of electrons, protons, and other particles. The body electric is thus also made of electrons, protons, and other particles. It would make sense then to anyone that knows this, that this should be used in medicine to measure the body electric and to develop therapies that are to do with electronics. Let us take, for example, an idea that if a scientist were to develop a measuring device and perfect it, and a device that not only measured but was able to give out electronic pulses, that was able to be used for therapy. If a scientist were to be able to develop something like this and perfect it, that scientist may or may be a little bit unpopular with people that may be threatened by this device. Let's look at this a little deeper. Who could possibly be threatened by the idea of an electronic device that had no side effects, that caused no harm, but caused some kind of therapy that gave some kind of healing. Well, people that were profiting from healing people in other ways. People who were making chemicals, synthetic drugs, pharmaceuticals. If therefore a scientist were able to develop and perfect a machine such as this, it would be logical that he wouldn't be so popular with those people that were profiting from drugs that they were selling, from materials that they were selling, because it would hurt their business. Let's look at a little bit at synthetic drugs. What would happen if the same scientist who found or invented a machine like that were to also find and prove that synthetic drugs, chemicals, were incompatible with the human body, that it caused harm to the human body. Yes, there were immediate healing effects, relief of symptoms, but it caused serious harm, long-term damage, and even killed people. What would happen to this scientist? The purpose of doing an interview is to get information and present it to your audience in a fair and balanced way. And in order to do this, 
you have to ask certain questions and find out what the story is. And in the interview that I just saw over the last five hours, which was the tape that you haven't seen with Desiree, explaining about her son Daniel's autism, which is the reason why she initially got into alternative medicine and certain things of this aspect is not even presented. Desiree spent three hours explaining and showing and proving that synthetic drugs are an insult to the human body and they didn't show not one iota of that part of the interview. Desiree showed them over 200 studies and 80 textbooks and they didn't reference any of that material which supports her research when you purposely hide information that your viewers would be able to make a conscious uh, decision about what they're hearing and, and what it is that they're supposed to understand it is a lie by omission and about 90 plus percent has been left out of the interview that would support what Desiree is doing. A miracle device claiming to treat autism, Parkinson's, and just about everything in between. Quantum biofeedback borders the fine line of healing with the help of electronic frequencies, a practice so controversial that lawyers for Austin's own Lance Armstrong have filed a cease and desist order. KXA's Matt Fleener investigates these amazing claims in today's Live Well Health Alert. Matt? Well, right behind me is the EPFX, the Electrophysio Frequency x -roid. It claims to help your body heal itself by sending electric signals to cells in your body that have negative energy. But the FDA says it can't be imported into this country anymore. It's investigating the developer who is a federal fugitive. And there are still more than 10,000 devices here in the United States, many here in Austin. It's quantum physics. It looks like something out of a sci-fi novel. Science on this is like solid proven. Hooked up to the EPFX, James Cambridge is ready for his stress-reducing session. The higher the reaction, the more stress. Melissa Rogers is the specialist. Concentrate on your knee. By clicking a few buttons, including one labeled treat, she says the EPFX will help Cambridge's knee. It's measuring the stress. 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 Stress is the key word for the biofeedback device. Anytime anybody's sick, you've got stress. And Cambridge says with months of EPFX sessions to reduce knee stress, his knee pain is gone. You know, I can, if I want to run up the steps, two steps at a time, no problem. I have fibromyalgia. But for someone diagnosed with constant pain. And the sicker I've become, the more of a skeptic I've become. Molly Black has posted online how she thinks the EPFX is quackery. I just want people to not be taken in. Her sister used the device to help reduce her allergies and tried to persuade Black to do the same to relieve her pain. She's the one who told me about this machine, so I did some online research. She found a wealth of information about the device's inventor, William Nelson. In 1993, Nelson moved to Budapest, Hungary. Federal court records show authorities indicted him on fraud charges for the EPFX. He reappeared in Hungary, a country with different laws, and now makes millions on EPFX sales from a worldwide distribution network. Machines like this encourage the thought process that people cause their own cancer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing on the FDA. Congress is now investigating the EPFX, but by using terms like stress reduction, it's still legal and people can still make money. In fact, he had not uh, ever used the machine. Some therapists even used Austin's own Lance Armstrong to endorse the device. He's never used it. Uh, 
He doesn't know anything about it, and uh, he certainly has, uh, has never endorsed it. Ten EPFX websites were ordered to cease and desist after Armstrong's attorneys discovered the sites were misrepresenting an endorsement. Armstrong's former chiropractor, Jeffrey Spencer, claimed he used the machine on U.S. cycling team members during the 2003 Tour de France. He's so fast! But Spencer never claimed he used it on Armstrong. Molly Black says she'd never use it. I haven't tried a lot of things in my life. That doesn't mean that I need to try them in order to find out they're going to be good or bad for me. That's the Frankenstein part of it all, man. For those that aren't scared away by the controversial science... The best money I've ever spent. The best money I've ever spent. The best money I've ever spent. While it's still legal, they'll continue to pay for more. There's nothing that any of them can say that's going to make me believe it doesn't work. And a spokeswoman for the biggest EPFX distributor here in the United States said, quote, we're working alongside the FDA to address any concerns they have, and we are also waiting on a promised phone interview from Hungary with the device's inventor, William Nelson. When and if that happens, we'll post it on KXAN.com. In the NBC interview, they show a woman that has never been on the device saying that she wouldn't go on the device. How does this support anything negative against skill? Some of you may think that it is impossible in this society to persecute someone, especially falsely, when they're right. Some of you may think that our society has uh, defense mechanisms built into it to stop this from happening. Well, let me tell you, it is more than possible in this world. It is happening. Professor William Nelson, a.k.a. Desiree de Bonnet, has invented such a machine. This machine has been used for many, many years. She has treated and she has measured millions and millions of patients she has written hundreds of journals, hundreds of clinical studies. Desiree has also proven, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the chemicals that the pharmaceuticals make, that the drug companies make, that are put into the bodies of millions of people have caused damage, have severe side effects. And for goodness sake, even the paper in every box of pharmaceutical medicine that is made says to you, every single box, there are many side effects possible from this drug, even to the point of death. It's written on the box. And she has also proven that this happens day in, day out. Millions, not thousands, millions, many millions of people have died as a result. First, we have street drugs mm -hmm. and we have medicinal drugs. Now, medicinal drugs kills far more people than street drugs do. Right. Uh, street drugs is a small part of deaths, very, very small part. Right. And um, in fact, the, the, the largest cause of death in America uh, is what we call iatrogenic. Iatrogenic is a two-bit word which means it's doctor done. Okay, yeah. so if you look at the complications of surgery, the infections acquired in the hospital, and the deaths from drugs prescribed by doctors, that's the largest group of deaths in America. Nelson's $20,000 medical device is being sold across Canada, which is why we keep looking for evidence that it works. We head to McMaster University in Hamilton and show Nelson's study. Stop, stop, stop. What did this reporter did say? <laughs> They're going to take a copy of my study? Oh, oh, oh. We sent them three big 
boxes of material. We sent them 200 studies. We sent them 50 books. I have over 80 books. We sent them three big boxes of scientific evidence, over 200 studies. They looked at everything. They looked at my credentials. They looked at the diplomas. They're trying to find something to critique. They found one study, took it to the guy. He found one picture out of this much material. And this was a doctor who was hired to poo-poo alternative medicine. Are you people being told the truth? Is there some type of twist going on with this media? If there was an honest, open reporting of the media, this doctor would have a debate. All of this material would be discussed and reviewed, item by item. But not in the media, see. The media doesn't work like that. The media is involved with persecution. I sent them over 80 medical textbooks, over 100 books, over 200 different studies. I'm going to flash them on the screen, just some of them, to show you what was going on from around the world and over the last 30 years of different research. And much of this is done in the press, active press, but many of this is done in peer-reviewed medical journals with proper ISSN numbers. As we can see these lists going on and on, all showing safety, efficacy, and incredible results of a non-drug, drugless therapy using biofeedback and electrical stimulation, incredible results, and yet they ignored it. Now, in the interview, after working for three hours to tell them about the synthetics and why people need a choice, she badgered me and badgered me and badgered me. Why don't I have studies? After I've shown her studies, I've shown her all of this over and over and over again. So she finally kept badgering, badgering, and badgering me. You didn't see any of this, but if you want to see the real total five-hour interview, let us know. You can look at it, and you'll see why I got a little angry. You see, because maybe you might want to get a little angry now and then. Maybe you might want to draw the line and say, you know what, you've gone too far. Because that's what happened to me. I finally got angry at these people after showing them this incredible, incredible, long compilation of work, all done to the letter of the law, statistically showing and proving how the system works and works well. And yet they twisted this. They didn't tell you any of this. They didn't show you these things. They showed you a little bit, and then she started badgering me how I could be lying when she was telling the biggest lie of all. And then she was going to put this and cut this massive five-hour interview to fit what they have already wanted to say. Because the drug companies aren't going to make profit if people are going to tell the truth that all synthetic drugs are an insult to the body. Is that news what i have seen after looking at five hours of the whole interview and the 10 minute clip is completely egregious and libel against desiree it is not just irresponsible but it's an obvious persecution plan against her to smear her name with no evidence and no factual support whatsoever. I would have to work against these corporations. I worked with the Chinese in the Chinese Olympics. And you know what? I was so, so glad that they gave me an honorary gold medal. To oncologist Dr. Steven Sager. Dr. Steven Sager, let's take a look at a little bit of some of his writings. Dr. Sager is a hitman. He's hired to go after natural medicine. And he's hired to favor the synthetic pharmaceuticals. That's his job. It's supposedly cured. This is the uh, scab falling off a tumor. There's still cancer left behind. There's still cancer left behind. He's, he's diagnosing cancer 
from a photograph. From a photograph, he's diagnosing cancer. You're kidding me. Now, we sent him pictures. Now, he doesn't use... Here's a picture of a man with cancer tumors, went to the doctor, all over the face. They scheduled him for surgery. He went on the machine. You can see the pictures, improvement. Here is him just on the skio, just the skio therapy, months later, cured. And here's the tumors that fell off. This man was scheduled for chemotherapy and for surgery. Doesn't show you those pictures, does he, from Mr. McGill? How about this German study? Here, this was sent to him. There's a picture of a tumor. It was the size of a grapefruit. Complete story of how the medical doctor, medical doctor's wife had this. She sat on the ski all night. By the next morning, it's the size of a golf ball. And within two weeks, it's gone. He doesn't show you that picture. Here's a story. Here's a picture of a lung tumor before, after. He doesn't show you that picture. A breast tumor before, after, gone. He doesn't show you this picture. He doesn't show you any of these pictures. He doesn't tell you any of these stories. We showed him 2,000 stories. He doesn't tell, he takes one and he diagnoses cancer from a picture. Now, we didn't claim that. That picture came to us from the doctor. The doctor has told us that that cancer has now been completely eradicated. This doctor from CBC should be doing the due diligence of making a phone call and trying to talk to the other doctors. That's called due diligence. But see, that wouldn't be good for persecution. That wouldn't be good for a slur. Uh, doctors have said that uh, the SCIO device is not scientific. Well, it's, uh, I think uh, they, don't, they don't know the definition of science. You know, and they're putting everything on limited uh, observation. SCIO is scientific, definitely scientific. But science needs to extend also, because we have definitions which they are against the limited pattern, limited education. And uh, that's what is, uh, I think, biggest uh, misunderstood in the medical world. Uh, people have said that the device is useless with, useless with cancer patients. Well, you had cancer patients? Yes, I had. Yes, I had, and uh, some of them, they improve, really, and some of them are getting healed because they start to understand what is cancer all, and what is uh, all healing process. We try to put definition cancer is something that is very bad for us. And I have uh, people who said, okay, I never had a better life because I recognize life now, and I start to change. When they start to change, they got healed. Because uh, cancer is some message that you need something to change. And we can do healing process, bring all levels of our lives on higher level of vibrations, and cancer getting out of the body, they're going out, disappear. That's kind of uh, possible. I mean, it's a bogus treatment and uh, apart from the distress it's going to cause uh, patients, in some cases it may actually uh, prevent them from having early conventional and effective cancer treatment on time, in which case their cancer could progress and they could actually die from their cancer, whereas, whereas they could have been cured earlier. <sighs> they won't have enough money to buy chemotherapy. Now, there's, cancer is a quasi-industry here. There's, that's why it's called uncurable. And 2,000 out of 7,000 isn't the cure rate, even though it is better than probably traditional treatments. Now, what I'm saying is that in their world, they have to refute this, or else his entire training of only knowing pharmaceuticals and surgery that's all he knows. And as soon as somebody says volts and amps to him, 
he's lost. But our next question puts Nelson over the edge. Is there a part of you that feels bad that you're misleading people? There's a part of me that feels bad that the Canadian people are being deceived. And that somebody has employed a wacko. I'm sorry, let I don't me, Let me talk you. to the only camera yeah. that's going to show anything. Okay, no, well. Let me talk to the only camera that's going to tell the story. The only place that they're going to see the truth. Get on the internet. Look at this yourself. <laughs> Look at this yourself, people. Well, why are you saying... Find out why are you what is really going on here. I'm just here. asking for what, scientific evidence. Because you keep saying that it's not a peer-reviewed journal. It is a peer-reviewed medical journal. You keep saying all this stuff that it's not this and not that. You have twisted everything as, I'm, as I am completely cognizant I, that I'm, you will twist this entire interview. You see, CBC is lying to you. A lie by admission is when someone does not tell you key information that they know, but they only want to tell you a small slanted part of the information. When they twist, contort, slant the truth, and they edit the tape to tell you only the parts of the truth that they want to influence your decision. A lie by, by admission, because CBC didn't show you all this. Good journalism should give you the whole information for you to make an informed choice. That would be good journalism. CBC is grossly lying to you and is not doing proper ethical journalism. Just why, might we ask? Let's take a look at just some of CBC's many lies. Number one, they don't tell you that Professor Nelson is a qualified professor of medicine and accredited medical university. As a provider of information, he derives no income from the EPFX. They try to delude you into thinking that this is my machine. It is not. I'm just one of the scientists who worked on it. They do not interview or show you any of the staff at the International Medical University. That would not be good journalism. It would not be good for their persecution. They do not show you the total studies that they received from the university. That's a mission. They do not tell you that Dr. Sager is paid to put down alternative medicine. This is what he does. He does this many times, many places. And they don't tell you about the investments he has in the pharmaceutical cartel. They do not show you the accredited professional registered peer-reviewed medical journals who have published positive articles relating to EPFX. They do not show you the science and the books and the thousands of studies done on the body electric. They do not show you any of the thousands of testimonials, the incredible stories of success, the pictures, the incredible pictures of the success of this device. They do not tell you that stress reduction is a valuable part of medicine and that when you reduce stress, the body gets healthier. They do not show you any of the three hours of information that we did against the tobacco and the drug companies. They don't show you any of this. None of that's discussed. They do not show you the synthetic proof that synthetic drugs are not compatible with the human body. I showed them that proof, but they don't want to tell you that. They do not tell you that the drug companies persecute Dr. Nelson. They don't want to tell you about that. They show you a cut from the movie that I made called Sworn on the Altar about the persecution of me. They show it to you, but they don't reference to you how to get it or what it is or how you might be able to see it, because if you saw it, you'd have a different idea. We have offered to debate, but they don't tell you that, because, you see, they don't want to debate. If there was a debate, then maybe you would have a good, clear information. The CBC is lying to you by admission in the cases of the studies. In fact, in many, many ways, the CBC is lying to you, a very good example of bad journalism. They tell you only what is good for the persecution of Dr. Nelson. The drug companies fear all drugless therapies, and they attack Professor Nelson. They attack me. Become a journalist, you have to be one of those, let's say, geeks in the school to finish school perfectly. And for those kids to enter the journalist school, which is the most biggest competition there, it's very hard. They are geeks. They a, lot of, a lot of competition. A lot of competition to get into school to become journalists, one of them. Which brings that, you know, nobody likes in the school geeks. They are, all of them live under pressure of the people. They're full of angriness most of the time. I know all the journalists, they, they're full of angriness. They never want to write a good story, most of them. After that, the government, the company where we work, they support them in that way. They need those people. Because nobody interesting about lady who's growing the flowers in balcony at winter. 
people interesting in the blood, in the dead body. Even when I was in school, we was teaching, we call that a uh, dead body. When you write letter for a media to come over, we have to have dead body. That was the terminology for how to attract dead body. I mean, that explained everything in the news. You have to tell bad story. In order to get promotions. Exactly. You want to get promotions, you want to be popular, you want to do your career. You have to do that. There's no other way. You have to do what? You have to find a dead body. Even if it doesn't exist. Cool. say that this mechanism is in part how terrorism actually works to, to frighten us. And is there some way that we could counteract <laughs> that? I actually was uh, consulting recently with the Department of Homeland Security, which generally believes that uh, American security dollars should go to making borders safer. I tried to point out to them that terrorism was a name based on people's psychological reaction to a set of events, and that if they were concerned about terrorism, they might ask what causes terror and how can we stop people from being terrified rather than not rather than, but in addition to stopping the atrocities that we're all concerned about. Surely the kinds of, uh, of a play that at least American media give to, and forgive me, but in, st in raw numbers, these are very tiny accents. We already know, for example, in the United States that more people have died as a result of not taking airplanes because they're scared and driving on highways than were killed in 9-11, okay? If I told you that there was a plague that was gonna kill 15,000 Americans next year, you might be alarmed if you didn't find out it was the flu. These are small-scale accidents, and we should be wondering whether they should get the kind of play, the kind of coverage that they do. Surely that causes people to overestimate the likelihood that they'll be hurt uh, in these various ways and gives power to the very people who want to frighten us. I'd like to hear more on this. So you're, you're saying that our response to terror is, I mean, it's a form of mental bug. Out, what, it's talk, outsized. Talk more about it. It's outsized. I mean... Look, if Australia disappears tomorrow, terror is probably the right response. That's an awful large lot of very nice people. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, when a bus blows up and 30 people are killed, more people than that were killed by not using their seatbelts in the same country. Is terror the right response? What causes the bug? Is it the drama of the event, that it's so spectacular? Is it the fact that it's an intentional attack by, quote, outsiders? What is it? Yes. It's a number of things, and you hit on several of them. First, it's a human agent trying to kill us. It's not a tree falling on us by accident. Uh, second, these are enemies who may want to strike and hurt us again. Uh, people are being killed for no reason instead of good reason, as if there's good reason, but sometimes people think there are. So there are a number of things that together make this seem like a fantastic event. But let's not play down the fact that newspapers sell when people see something in it they want to read. So there's a large role here played by the media who want who want these things to be as spectacular as they possibly can. I mean, what would it take to persuade our culture to downplay it? Well, go to Israel. You know, go to Israel and a mall blows up and then everybody's unhappy about it. And an hour and a half later, at least when I was there, and I was 150 feet from the mall when it blew up, I went back to my hotel and uh, the wedding that was planned was still going on. And as the Israeli mother said, she said, we never let them win by stopping uh, stopping weddings. I mean, this is a society that's learned, and there are others too, that has learned to live with a certain amount of terrorism and not be quite as uh, uh, upset by it, shall I say, as those of us who've not had many terror attacks. But isn't, is there a rational, a rational fear that actually the reason we're frightened about this is because we think that the big one is to come? Yes, big... of course. So uh, if, we, if we knew that this was the worst attack there would ever be, there might be more and more buses of 30 people, we would probably not be nearly so frightened. I don't want to say, please, I'm going to get quoted somewhere as saying, terrorism is fine and we shouldn't be so distressed. That's not my point at all. What I'm saying is that surely rationally, our distress about things that happen, about threats, should be roughly proportional to the size of those threats and threats to come. I think in the case of terrorism, it isn't. And many of the things we've heard about from our speakers today, how many people do you know got up and said, poverty, I can't believe what poverty is doing to this. People get up in the morning, they don't care about poverty. It's not making headlines, not making news, it's not flashy, there are no guns going off. I mean, if you had to solve one of these problems, Chris, which would you solve, terrorism or poverty? <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah, there's no question. Poverty, by, by an order of magnitude, a huge order of magnitude, unless someone can show that 
that there's, you know, terrorists with a nuke are, are really likely to come. The latest I've read, seen, thought is that it's incredibly, right. incredibly hard for them to do that. If that turns out to be wrong, we all look silly. But, but no, po- poverty, true? it's... But, Even and, if that were true, still more people die from poverty. <laughs> Desiree Dubonet. And I remember one of the first times I'd done an interview here in Hungary. Uh, the Hungarian television, MTV, Magyar television, came here. And they said, what's one word to describe you? What are you? Because you sing rock and roll, you make TV, you, you, you're doing movies, movie producer, etc. You know, all these things that you do. And I said, well, what I am to the media is scary, you see? Because what I am is a versatile person. I'm very, very versatile. And versatility is something that the media doesn't want. They want to put you in a box, put you in a little box. And I'm very talented as an engineer and a medical doctor and a quantum physicist, and I write books, and I make movies, and I produce and direct, and I star, and... I do so many things well, and I'm very, very versatile. Incredible singer. On and on and on. TV show came out, and they said, What are you, Desi? And came on, and report said, What I am is scary. Stop. <laughs> and I kind of realized that they twist things. Okay. Then the major television, the public television, which is the number one channel here in, in Hungary, they came and they got uh, EC money for a show called The Provocateur to do studies and present shows and ideas about discrimination. The man came and shot a whole little story and I told them how 7 to 10% of the people of the world are born left-handed. Most people are born right-handed and 7 to 10% are born left-handed. Now the choice of the hand does not take place in the hand, the choice takes place in the brain. Now, 7 to 10% of the people of the world are born with a cross-gender preference. Most people, people are, quote, quote hetero, hetero, and some, some people have, have a different, different preference. preference. This, this happens, happens all over the world, world and this happens, happens since the beginning of humankind. People, kind. people 7, 7 to 10% of the population, population is born with a cross-gender cross preference. preference. And 7 to 10% of the people are born with a cross-handed preference. This happens. Typical. And now I said only 2% of the people of the world live it. Since only 2% of the people live it, that leaves 5%, roughly one person in 20, the same percentage of people that are psychopaths in the population, by the way. 2% of the people express their cost gender sexual preference. The rest of this people, 5 to 8% of the people, suppress it, repress it, push it deep into their psyche. These are the people who become the homophobics. Who else would pick up a stone and throw it? Somebody who's so fearful. And what would fear come from? What are you afraid of? You're only afraid of yourself. You're afraid of some humiliation that somebody might think that you are homosexual. Studies, studies have shown, shown that the more, more intense, intense the homophobia, homophobia that, that the violent, violent homophobia, homophobia people are, are all, all late, late homosexuals. homosexuals. Listen, Listen to this, this the intense, intense violent, violent homophobic, homophobic people are all latent, latent homosexuals. homosexuals. I told I that told little, little story. story. The man looked at me in from provocateur and he said, Oh my God, he said, you could end this, this issue of discrimination. If that was published, and he said, we'll put this on the television immediately. This is great because this would end the, 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 the case. Nobody's going to want to you know, uh, do anything violent to homosexuals when they could be exposed as a latent homosexual. TV, the Hungarian television, lost the tape. He came back to me and he said, I'm sorry, but somebody lost the tape, one of the big executives. Six months later, he was so excited, he came back and he shot it again. He says, 
this is such a great story. So he shot it again. We did a whole show again. And I told my little two-minute story. And they lost the tape again. The man quit and said he was fed up with how upper people in the media could control and change things. So he decided he was disgusted by that. I'm here to tell you that having dealt with the media for years and years, and when I went to Arlon in Belgium in the Marc Dutroux case, and I brought a copy of the movie, the story of Marc Dutroux, The Greatest Sin, and how I was able to prove that there was an international ultra-rich pedophile gang that was selling children, killing children, many in Satanistic rituals. I had the proof of this. And not one person from the media would listen or cover the story. That's when I recognized that there really was an ultra-rich control of the media, an ultra-rich control that was censoring, making sure certain stories don't get told making sure that certain stories were slanted would not be offensive to the ultra-rich. What I've done here in this little movie is to try to show you how the media does create problems in the world. And it's not easy for them to tell the true story in an even and balanced fashion. But now it's gotten even much, 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 much worse. It's gotten even much, 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 it's gotten even much, 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 much worse. They attack me because the EPFX works and works really, really well. There are hundreds of articles published in accredited, registered, professional, peer-reviewed medical journals proving the EPFX to be safe and very, very, very effective. In the next part, what can you do? The CBC has bad journalism. Very there's a bad. reason. There's a reason. There's a reason for this. There's a reason education sucks because the owners of this country don't want that. I'm talking about the real owners now. The big, re the wealthy, that, the real owners, the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. They're, they're, they're an irrelevant. The, the politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They got you by the balls. They, they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying, lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everybody else. But I'll tell you what they don't want. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interest. That's right. Yeah, they don't really want critical thinking. They like celebrity worship, not really critical thinking. They like the idea of always wanting something different. Then they have to make these celebrities, but not like the days in the 60s where we had protests. Now no, pro, no real protest movies, no protest songs. Celebrities only chosen that are going to follow the right line. All controlled by a very, very wealthy. You see, our children today can't read. They can't find America on a globe. They don't know who won the Civil War. They don't know anything about the teachings of Jesus or law. But they do know who won the Academy Awards, who wrote their favorite songs, what the celebrities had for breakfast, and what kind of car do celebrities drive, and the shoes that they wear. The ultra-rich have replaced education with celebrity worship, freedom with computer control. They've replaced justice with fear of indictment, replaced honor with greed, replaced love with hate and they foster all the false beliefs that make them money. The people have no skills to discuss any issues anymore. They can't do anything. You see, it's all about celebrity worship. As if that really is enough. It is not. There's no agency or person that judges the news agencies. They have no real judge. They can just go out there and make up stories and nobody really scolds them. It's up to, for people to sue them when they spin. But suing them is difficult and lengthy and people are terrified of these big, big money people. 
When you get into a lawsuit, it's not about right or wrong, it's about money. It's all for sale. Much for passes for on television is just what the rich people want. It's all a twist. It's all sensationalized. You see, because greed is good. Greed's becoming God. Only sexy people, sexy pictures sell. It's not really fair news. It's constantly being twisted. All spun. It's not really right or left, it's right or wrong. We have to stop this idea about the sensationalism. We have to be able to create a new idea. We have to be able to highlight the battle between the ultra-rich and the other people. And there's a time that maybe even you want to say, you know, I've had enough. I'm a human being, my life has value. You know, sometimes you might want to just say that. Let's take a look at what the Chinese have said again. Media are fundamental in our societies and they constitute the major sources of information. The social responsibility of the media is to pursue the truth, but not at the cost of ordering people's privacy. The press has a duty to stay neutral, objective, and balanced in all circumstances. It is also important for the public to enjoy a vibrant and diverse media, and hear voices from different perspectives. Reporting the news is a privilege and a responsibility and it is not exploitable. After starting a war, you might realize how terrible it really is and try to stop it, but it's too late. You can't stop a war once it begins. Then, what do we need to do to make sure we don't start one? That's easy. We need to find out what's actually happening in the world. What are other countries like the United States, China or Russia thinking about? We must be aware of the reality that surrounds us and honestly let each other know. The true role of journalism is to investigate events in the world and present correct information on them to the public. That way people are able to make cool-headed decisions. But as we just saw from how the media behaved in a wartime, what's apparent is that things start going wrong for the whole country as soon as the media runs off the rails. It really doesn't take much time for the nation's fate to change drastically. The media has that kind of power. And we've been reminded of that fact. Yes, we have to realize that what happens when the media goes off the rails with lies to the public, it really does hurt us all. When things are twisted, spinned, exaggerated, embellished. We need good stories, not just stupid, sensationalistic journalism. This is not some kind of way out conspiracy theory. We're not, we're not talking about something that is science fiction. Look at it. Examine it yourself. And when you've seen both sides, and when you've seen both sides objectively, make your own decision. The objective of journalism is to give a fair and balanced and unbiased presentation of both sides of an issue. And what I have seen is completely irresponsible and egregious and has a, a hidden agenda against alternative medicine. This story goes deeper than just the interview. There is something behind what these news reporting agencies and media organizations are doing. There is a push from the ultra-rich and from the synthetic drug companies to control alternative medicine because it cuts into their profits. There is a fear that if people have a choice that they will lose profit and they take the general public as being ignorant enough to follow whatever it is that they present to them because they are such huge media organizations that they will do anything that they can and say anything 
and feel like everybody will follow them like blind mice. Do not let them take your choice away. Open your eyes, do some due diligence, and look and find out the facts. Finding the facts isn't easy. You see, the powerful, greedy, ultra-rich people, they want to manipulate the minds, and they own the media, and they want to control this and push these things on us and spoon-feed us these things. It's not easy to find the real stuff, and the Internet is full of all kinds of unvalidated lack of fact-checking. We don't really want to trust the corporate media, but then what else can we do? We have to really look and explore and count on other people to help us. I tried to make a whole bunch of movies to help this. You see, they're... The FDA and the drug companies are sitting on the research that really does absolutely, without a doubt, prove that a synthetic drug is an insult to the body. They don't want that out because that would interfere with their sales. So what do they do? Well, it's very simple. They buy the media. They make sure nobody really covers that story. They make sure that the FDA doesn't really see the story. They don't see things. They have conflict of interest. They make sure that chiropractic colleges. They make sure that certain stories are not going to be told. They make sure that those different things are not going to be discussed. Hmm. It's not that difficult to do when you have a couple of billion dollars to make sure that people don't listen to these different stories. I've made movies about the synthetic drug companies but not to be shown or heard, shuffled away. Made movies about eco-economic education, showing that that's the crux, the key point, but all whisked away. I've made movies about the big head versus the little head, all shuffled, pushed away. Books, movies, and etc. about the body electric, but uh, not to be seen by the public. It's not really free speech anymore. It's media controlled. Censorship is happening. Trying to make sure that Americans have the blinders on, don't really see the full story, but see the story that they want. Even the internet is becoming more and more censored. And you see, freedom of speech is not a great equalizer when the ultra-rich control most of what's heard. You're going to need to raise your voice a little louder, a little louder now, a little louder, a little softer now. You have to get good, informed ideas about many different things. You have to be able to look deeper. Don't just be spoon-fed by the media. Don't be spoon-fed by the big corporations. You see what happens when you get too much of the big corporations. You see, they write the different stories, but what can you do? What can you do? Well, an invasion of armies can be resisted, but not an idea whose time has come. I put the ideas into my movies. There's a whole persecution movie to explain about the persecution. Return to the garden, how we can return and bring harmony back to the planet. The chess movie. I've made over 50 different movies, quality full-length movies, I've written over a hundred medical textbooks, different other books, journals, teaching videos, the teachings of Jesus, the war crimes of Harry S. Truman, many, many different things to help get different opinions across. Not to say what is true or false, but different opinion, freedom of speech. The multimedia ultra-rich have deprived that and made sure that none of my stuff can come forward. And that really is proof that there's a problem. Desiree is the man who left America to find freedom and who is no longer a man, but possibly an angel. So what to do? It's about learning critical thinking. But it's not just about right or wrong, because that's very difficult to discuss and how to really know. It's about discussion, freedom of choice, freedom of information, freedom of speech, development, true democracy. There's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. We need to discuss these different ideas. And the media has been all about squashing different ideas. It's time for us to open our minds and open our hearts and open the media. This is Desiree signing off. Three, two, one. Three, cue announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it. How do you feel? We're mad as hell, and we're not going to take this anymore.
because less than 3% of you people read books. Because less than 15% of you read newspapers. Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, prime ministers. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it ever falls into the hands of the wrong people. The largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world. Who knows what shit will be peddled for truth on this network?